Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining us on today's live stream, our mental health awareness roundtable. Uh, I just want to first start off by saying thank you very much for being here with us. This is going to be a great discussion that we're going to have. Uh, going to definitely get some insight from uh, a, a couple of people that are here with us that will be discussing the mental health um especially in first responders because of what we're going through right now it definitely will be um beneficial but before i get into introducing our guests we do have a um message from our good friend jonathan dempsey over at uh red laces so i'm gonna go ahead and, and shoot his message over he wanted to be a part of this but he's over in the uk uh, and he, you know, he had some other prior engagements. So, uh, without further ado, here's our message from uh, Jonathan Dempsey from Red Laces. Hi, I'm Jonathan Dempsey, founder and director of Red Laces, the consultancy that helps you solve your strategic, operational, safety, and environmental risks. Based over here in the UK, and also supporting clients internationally. Proud to support the Global Mental Health Awareness Roundtable uh, that Pedro Maciel is chairing. Uh, Pedro has been a proud supporter of our Red Laces Mental Health Campaign, uh, a video campaign that's been uh, involving 30 people or more from across the world, from France, Nigeria, Ghana, Australia, Canada, uh, USA and more. Um, just really making uh, mental health more, uh, removing the stigma, I guess, um, just trying to make it that it's a normal part of conversation. Uh, we all have up days, we all have bad days. Uh, there are things that we can do to try and keep our energy levels up. Uh, eating well, resting well, drinking water, getting some exercise. Getting out near water it really helps me. So I'm here in Stratford Avon today. Just getting out, uh, getting some extra rays of sun, some vitamin D, uh, getting out near the boats and just uh, getting feeling that buzz and that vibe. Um, in the UK, there are plenty of charities that can help. Uh, there's Mates in Mind, there's Safety, uh, State of Mind Sport, um, there's uh, Young Minds, uh, there's a whole raft of them. Uh, but some research I did recently, only 4% of people said that they would go to their manager with a mental health issue. So for those line managers and leaders amongst you, um, you know, what does that mean? How are you, how are you gonna make sure, or how, how are you gonna reach out to your teams uh, before and if they do need some support? But similarly, friends and family, um, you know, it's okay to, to speak up and we need to encourage you to speak up. But if you're, you're actually okay and you've not been struggling, chances are, you know, people are going to turn to their friends and family. So uh, if somebody does come to you, somebody who cares about, uh, somebody you care about comes to you, how can you support them? Uh, the videos that we've got on YouTube are freely accessible. They're only one minute, so they help. Uh, but there's plenty of things you can do and you're going to hear a lot more about it on this roundtable. So there we go. There we go. Thank you, Jonathan, for giving us that uh, message and, and your insight. Um, definitely love what Red Laces is doing. So without further ado, let me introduce my guests that we have, the ones that decided to say yes to the Mental Health Roundtable, uh, because it's definitely a good, good issue um, that we're talking about this. It's okay to talk about mental health. Um, so first off, let me introduce to the stream, Miss Chelsea Davenport. Hey, Chelsea, how are you? Hi, everybody. And Bella decided to join as well. There you go. That's good. It's always good to have our furry friends uh, with, with us while we do this. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Chelsea, and you know what, um, what you do, and then we'll introduce the, the rest of the guests. Well, first of all, I wanted to say uh, thank you so much for, for having me on and letting me be a part of this. And... Um, I am the co-founder, I'm mean, sorry, I'm the founder of Peak One Wellness, which is a organization um, aimed at helping with preventative solutions and resources for the first responder community, um, as well as the founder of Healthy Hire, Healthy Retire, a nonprofit organization that helps with first responders and their family members in crisis. Um, we have an array of resources and partners that we have teamed up with that offer amazing um, services, as far as, um, including peer support, um, different support groups around the country. Um, but we also raise money to help contribute to any financial needs that first responders or their family members might have uh, to get the help. So if they need help with flights to get to and from a treatment facility, um, help with the deductibles, um, we've even helped with the expenses for 
a spouse while the first responder is away getting help as well. Got you. Got you. Okay. Well, and I, we look forward to getting to know you a little bit more, Chelsea, and actually, you know, getting your insight on some of the topics that we're going to discuss today. Uh, our next guest is Miss Jennifer Tracy. Hi. Hey, Miss Jennifer, how are you? I'm good. How are you tonight? Good. Good. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Miss Jennifer. Let our viewers and our listeners uh, know who Jennifer Tracy is and, and what you do. Yeah, it's an honor to be here. I'm so glad for all of you that are joining us live and who uh, will this be available afterwards, Pedro? Yes, this will be available afterwards. Sweet, that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, it's actually my honor that I get to uh, travel across the nation and speak to some of our finest, brave uh, military and first responders. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite things to do is to speak to, to groups of people. Um, what I discovered is that whenever I would share my story with people about uh, my battle with suicidal ideation, mm -hmm. Most people think that uh, that battle came after my husband and daughter were killed. But the truth is that I actually battled suicidal ideation before my husband and daughter passed away. And so that's what inspired me to write my book three years ago. And uh, it really inspires me to like keep talking about this topic because I realize how hard it is to reach out for help when you fear losing your job or when reaching out for help actually costs you. And so that's why I love to keep having these conversations. Um, yeah. So that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. And last but not least, none other than Mr. Chris Fields. <laughs> hey, Hello, Mr. Everybody. Chris, how are you? Good, sir. How are you? Good, good. So, Mr. Chris, let us know a little bit about yourself and what you do. What do I do? Well, not much now. I'm retired. But... Uh, no, I was, I did 31 years with the Oklahoma City Fire Department. I've been retired a little over three years now. And uh, throughout my career, especially after we experienced the Oklahoma City bombing, I, uh, I was diagnosed with PTSD. I went down the road with, um, you know, suicidal ideation and, and similar to uh, Jennifer's, but not as traumatic. I, I, when I went for my counseling to think I was going to address the bombing issue, I found out it wasn't just a bombing issue. It was accumulative stuff from years on the job, childhood events, all sorts of stuff. And so, um, you know, once I reached out for the help after I was at the bottom, I didn't have anywhere else to go but up. So once I did reach out and got the help I needed, I've been blessed to uh, be given a platform uh, to to go around and speak to other first responders about uh, mental health and reaching out and. Uh, and all that kind of stuff. And I also work with uh, Chelsea. I'm the vice president of, of the Healthy Hire, Healthy Retire uh, organization. So nice. that's uh, that's what I do. <laughs> what what a coincidence. What a coincidence. You guys know each other. No, uh, and we got some comments coming in. So before uh, we, we actually dive into it, uh, I'll show these on the screen so that way everybody can see them. Uh, Mr. Pat Welsh says, uh, Chelsea is the real deal for first responders. Thank you, Mr. Pat. Um, he also replied, Chris is a friend and colleague who gets, uh, who gets it as a first responder. So look at all this insight we're fixing to have on this round table. <laughs> um, and then, Ooh, look at that. Mr. Jonathan Dempsey. He actually, uh, he said, good evening, Pedro. Looking forward to the session. Thank you for the shout out and red laces. No, thank you, Jonathan, for that, you know, quite, you know, good message that you were able to give us. And, and, you know, we look forward to bringing you guys value. Um, so, and I was supposed to have Paul Clark on here. He, um, I know he had some other stuff that was lined up. So uh, it's going to be the four of us. There was five. Hopefully he'll show up here a, a little bit later, but we'll just dive into the discussion. Uh, and again, people that are watching right now, this live stream, send your questions in. We definitely want to hear from you guys. Uh, we definitely want to see uh, and, and get to know you if you have any kind of issues that you might want to talk about. Uh, we are all here to help and listen and, and walk you through this walk of life because, again, nobody does it alone. Um, so the, the very first question that I have and, and what people, some people might not understand is uh, what is the stigma behind mental health? 
you know, what stigma is there and, you know, define stigma. Um, and whoever uh, wants to, whoever wants to go, Mr. Chris, looks like you're ready well, to go. Well, well, I just know for me and, and, and having so many friends, of course, and family that are first responders, the stigma for first responders is that we're supposed to be the helpers. And it's tough for us to admit that we need help. Uh, we pride ourselves on getting there and making a bad situation better. And how can we do that if we're struggling mentally? And, and you know, and I know that was for me in the fire service because, you know, we work with a, a group and they're like family. I mean, you're with them 24 hours a day mm -hmm. and uh, you spend a 30, you know, a 25 year career. You spend a 30 year time at the fire station with this other family. And so it's just the uh, it's the same for people. Our first responders, just that fact of, you know, being vulnerable in front of your family. And for law enforcement, you know, just from the few that I get to interact with, you know, it's for them. They're worried about being taken off and their gun and their shield taken away and never getting it back. And it's just that stigma of of feeling like you're weak. And when I, I mean, I've seen such a shift in the nation, it's, it's getting better. The stigma is slowly, slowly. But it's still you just look at the suicide rate among first responders, law enforcement and, and firefighters so far this year. It's still it's still a, an issue. So I think it's just that 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 deal of being vulnerable and just and, and reaching out and admitting that you need the help when you're supposed to be the helper. Right. Yeah, And I think also it's the it's the perception that there's something wrong with you. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, that, that's you just, go ahead. I'm sorry, Chelsea. Oh, no, I said it. And like Chris said, being viewed uh, as being viewed as weak for asking for help. Right. And, and you know, uh, follow up to that, I guess, you know, what are we seeing today versus what we were seeing five years ago, 10 years ago? Uh, you know, how has it, in a sense, changed and, and how are we combating it to, to, to better uh, and, and get rid of that stigma? So Super. one of the things, I mean, one of the things for me, um, that I like to talk about is kind of this analogy of the check engine light and the check oil light. You know, if we were driving around today together and the light came on in your car while you were driving and it just said, check engine, check oil, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I like to ask people, would you feel fear, shame or guilt to drive that car or truck in and have it looked at? And not very many people would you, you know, feel fear or shame around that, right? And yet so often when we have those signals going off inside of our own mind, we just ignore them. Mm -hmm. You know, we stuff them. We think that it's part of the job or whatever. And so what I really am trying to do is help people to understand the sooner that we can uh, really take heed to that light, mm -hmm. the better chance we have of like repairing that car and getting it back out there and working. And so, um, you know, just really thinking about it that way. Like, what do you do when your car isn't working? You take it in and you get a diagnostic test, right? Yeah, right. Because it could be many things. And so that's kind of one of my favorite things to talk about is just that all of us come to that ledge so very differently. You know, for some people, it is a spiritual thing. Like they broke a moral code. For some people, it's a physical thing. Like myself, my thyroid was off, right? Mm -hmm. For some people, it's ongoing trauma and emotional stuff. Like everyone comes to that ledge so very differently. And so we have to help them identify for themselves what they need to do to fix their car, right? To get that light to go off. Right. Well, I've, I've seen a change in the fire service, especially here in Oklahoma City. Um, you know, now that they have the peer support teams and all that, people are, you know, proud to be a member of the peer. So they want to be involved. They want to help. Uh, I always tell them, you know, if you, you, you break your leg at a house fire, man, you get patted on the back. You're, you're a stud. You got, you know, you got your friends and families bringing you meals. If you're home laid up, same thing. If you get occupational, you know, cancer from the fire service, everybody mm -hmm. rallies around you. There's yep. that stigma with the mental health that everybody's like, Oh, uh, you struggle mentally. We might want to stay away, but I've seen such a, a change over the, over the years that uh, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a good sign. It's pretty open now. No, and that's awesome. And then Mr. Pat, again, Pat Wells, he's he's active in the chat. He said, how much do you guys see us versus them mindset, both by cops and from society uh, that affect the mental health issue, uh, you know, that cops face and first responders face? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Touchy, touchy. 
<laughs> she's old and fragile. Oh. Um, <laughs> I apologize. You know, I don't on on Pat's deal. I don't. I don't know how to answer it exactly, but I know what I see for police officers now is and firefighters. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast. Firefighters very seldom get the bad light, you know, on them. It's always, you know, we get there and make a bad police officers, law enforcement always catch the bad end of the rap. Well, now here, you know, plus the trauma they deal with and the things they see and the things they do now they're, dealing with the disrespect and the, some of the stuff they go through with now. So, I mean, it's, it's gotta be, I can't imagine the mental load they take on every, every shift they go on now. It's, uh, yeah. 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 The hardest thing about the, like us versus them, right. Is really helping people see that um, you do not choose. Like you don't wake up in the morning and say, you know, I want to have suicidal ideation thoughts all day. All day. <laughs> Right? No one chooses that. But what you do choose is what you're going to do about that. And that's what I really try to help people see is the power in that. Like how empowering it is to say, I'm not asking for this, but what I do with it is super powerful. Right. And, you know, it touches everyone, right? It touches people who have never been in the fire or the police. Like, I mean, it touches all of us. And so really reducing that stigma is saying it can, it can happen to any of us. Right. And, and for firefighters in a way, we're fortunate. We get off a traumatic house fire or car wreck or a bad, you know, medical call shooting, whatever. We can go back to the station. And I noticed that my last five years, especially after I came back and was pretty open about where I'd been and what I'd been through, you're back with your group, with your family. And if you want to talk about it, you can. Right law enforcement they're they're by themselves so much they get back in their car after a traumatic call and they go back on patrol and they're sitting there by them by themselves and uh so i think that's why uh, you know sometimes i think i see more effort by law enforcement to ad address mental health than i do from the fireside mm -hmm. but sometimes I, I get it too because we do have that little bit of benefactor of having some people to turn to if we need it and even if it's our dark humor sometimes that's what gets us through but, exactly. uh, but police officers being, you know, just by yeah. themselves, it would be tough. And can you imagine being a police officer and like on the home front, like your wife not understanding crude humor or black humor, or any of those things. And so it's like, you know, now you leave shift and you can't really tell anybody else. And so now you go home. And then for my myself, I was a person of faith. And I felt like then I'd go to church and those people didn't understand. Right. Right. And, right. Like, who can I bring this crap to right <laughs> exactly so right so that's like one of my favorite things is is talking with people about that really crappy stuff right that nobody else wants to talk about they're like what do you do jen i'm like i like to talk about the shit yeah. <laughs> like that, that's my favorite stuff to talk about because it's my reality right right and it, it doesn't get to me the way that it would somebody else so yeah. And it's with law enforcement too, one of the other differences is, um, you know, they've got access, so, you know, law enforcement, they're issued weapons. And so it's a little more risky when they start to feel right. their feelings, the fact that, you know, they've got more, more access, um, to, to, to go that route. And so, right. Yep. Now with, with that being said, and, and, you know, again, looking at the signs and figuring out what signs, uh, that we have to look or look for. What are some of the common signs that, you know, you can, somebody can, you know, I guess tell if their friend might be troubled and, you know, uh, have a, a little bit of mental instability. And then what are some of the uncommon signs, you know, like, you know, obviously bottling it up, not talking about it. That's one, but you know, what, what are some of the signs that, you know, people can look for uh, to help? Yeah, I think a lot of times you'll see people uh, change in behavior, showing up to work late, maybe drinking more. Um, you know, and we hear that people start to give things away. Maybe if they have a pet, they try to find a new home for it. Um, those are some of the examples that, that I've heard of that are uh, common. Well, for, for me, I know things I can look back now that I can admit to now that, of course, I used to argue with my wife. When she say she saw him and I told her she was crazy. And, uh, but it was the, uh, you know, the little isolation trying to be, you know, I used to be 
compete for father of the year every year, coach my boys in little league and, and doing everything. And I started drawing away from that. Uh, so isolation, a few more, you know, the, the no, you know, I used to, used to love to go golfing all the time. Well, yeah, yeah guys would call, go play golf. I wouldn't go. So quitting, you know, doing things that you love to do, just, just any of those signs of where you look, they're not themselves. You know, like I say the isolation, the depression, the, uh, you know, want to be by yourself more, um, not communicating, which was, you know, a big thing for me. I'm not a communication expert by any means, you know, but I learned that it may help when you come home from a bad shift, just to, if your wife or your spouse, you know, you just need to tell them, Hey, I just need a couple hours to take a nap or regroup something. Then we can go do whatever. Cause if you don't say anything to them, they think they're the problem. Yeah. And that's where it really starts to break down. And that was a lot of our issues was with me, but, uh, but for me, it was just mainly the isolation and, and the depression and, and real quick, I think Jennifer wants to jump in, but I real quick, I say, you said, what can people do? And it's just check on people and ask them if they're okay. And sometimes you don't just take, yeah, I'm good for an answer. I just had an encounter with it, not just years ago with a guy at the fire station, a younger guy that was always on the, I mean, there an hour early, always, I mean, just always hanging with the crew. And well, I noticed that he was starting to get to work a little later. And uh, and then he wouldn't after dinner, he'd just go isolate himself out in the rig room. So the station officer, I felt a responsibility. I just went out there and asked him, hey, is everything OK? He unloaded for like two hours mm -hmm. with issues he was having. And I asked him, you know, why? Why didn't you come? I told you when you came here, if you ever had anything, you know, this is your family. We need to talk. You know, he said, well, I didn't want to bring my personal problems to the fire station. Yep. And I said, well, what what changed tonight? He said, well, you asked. He said, and I felt when you asked. That gave me a door that opened a door for me to tell you. So then I started wearing people out. I was like, dude, you okay? You okay? You okay? So, <laughs> but I mean, that's, 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 that was big for me. Like I say, it was just reaching out to people and checking on them. And sometimes you can't, just can't take the, yeah, I'm okay for an answer. Yeah. And that's exactly what I was going to say is um, just having that, that courage uh, when you feel like someone may be going through something like, um, you know, if they are going through a divorce or they've lost, you know, a parent or a loved one to cancer, whatever it is, right? Just having that courage to just go right up to them and say, you know, a lot of times when people are going through a divorce, they actually think their life might be over and, and have mm -hmm. killing themselves. You know, are you having any of those thoughts? Like talk about it so boldly and giving them that permission to say, yeah, it's been pretty dark. It's exactly like what you said. When you have that um, that open conversation with them, it allows them just to unload. Right. And right. I can't tell you how many people have taken, you know, like when you ask them that question, then they have they feel free to tell you about it. Right. And sometimes just that alone removes the load from 70, 80, 90 percent back, you know, down to like, oh, it's out of the bag. Right. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's awesome. And, and you know, to kind of segue into, um, I know we're talking first responders and, you know, but what are first responders and just people in general, um, doing about mental health and our kids, you know, cause again, this is a totally new world. 2020 has thrown at us, you know, a, a pandemic, virtual learning, learning how to, how to shift, you know, what are some of the telltale signs in our kids that we should be looking for, uh, or, or you know, to, to help and, and kind of not be the overbearing parent that says, Hey, you know, what's wrong, but be able to kind of get them to talk and say, Hey, I'm having trouble with X, Y, Z. I, my, um, my client, load right now of parents who feel like they are failing miserably because you know they can't balance all of these things i tell every one of them how important it is to show their kids that it's actually okay to mess up just own what you you know own what you're going through tell them that you're sorry you know that you've let them down at that and um and communicate to them how you're feeling how you might even be feeling off that day because when you're honest with them about what you're going through, it allows them the freedom then to feel the same way. It lets them know, Hey, it's okay. If I'm having an off day, I can bring that to mom or dad. And so, you know, that, 
both of my girls now, my oldest will be 26 and my youngest is 22. And if you ask them, it was okay to talk about their dad and sister who died anytime, anywhere. We could talk about anything. And um, that's so important. I can't say how important communication is and providing that safe place for them just to talk about anything. Right. And, and that is true. I, I'm saying both. I got two sons, one's 27, one's 21, yep. but I can talk to them now about, and we think all oh, their kids, you know, they were younger, they were, you know, 10 and four and then 13 when all their stuff was going on. But we think all oh, their kids are resilient. They'll bounce back. They really don't even notice. They do notice. Oh yeah they aren't as resilient as we want them to be that we that the low we put on them that you know I, you can handle it. you're just a kid you'll bounce back so it's yeah it's, I, that was perfect what she said it's important to let the kids know what you're going through so they can see that it's okay that you're going to have bad days that we can't try to hide it and which i thought i was doing a pretty good job but my boys will uh yeah they they noticed and saw everything yeah, I think so. probably one of the universal telltale signs that someone's going through something is the isolation factor. I think right. a lot of people tend to like withdraw when they're feeling depressed and, you know, having having those sort of thoughts. So, you know, just making sure that you don't let that go, you know, don't don't notice that and not step in, try to get them out. Right. You feel like you don't want to step on their toes and, you know, like I said, so yeah, you just got to check on. Yeah, I, and, and you know, I have four daughters, so that oh, wow, it, yeah, that in itself <laughs> it, it, it is trying, but trying to talk to them and and you know, pick their brain and see you know, hey, what's going on? What's bothering you? What's the issue? And I guess they they see me being from you know a, a military background, being a workaholic, uh, sometimes bringing work home. And they're like, okay, well now I have to be like dad. I don't have to show emotion. I can't cry. <laughs> and, you know, and now it, it's, you know, tell me what you're, you know, you're going through. Let dad know what's, what's going on. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's definitely ask your kids what's going on. Ask your kids, Hey, are you having a problem? I need you to let me know. So that way I can find the best way to help you. Um, right. So it's a tough line that, that parent, slash his friend right. line. I mean, you want to be kind of be, you know, I love my boys. I want to be their buddy, you know, I'll play golf with them. But on the same breath, you got to be that, you got to be that parent too. And like you said, just checking on them and if they get mad, they get mad. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it's important to, without hovering, without being a helicopter parent, you know, and just wearing them out. It is, it's important to check on them and follow up on them. Yeah, we got some we got some comments coming in the chat. I, I love them. Uh, Danielle Buckley, Jennifer, love the check engine light analogy. Thank, Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we got uh, Mr. Tim Keaton. Uh, this is awesome, buddy. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. We you know we do this for you. Um, let's see the Tomasi Posse. Uh, great advice. We should be our brother's keeper and check in on one another. Loving the podcast. Appreciate it. Uh, we have uh, Jennifer Excellent. Martinez. This is awesome, y'all. Greatly appreciate you tuning in with us. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> she's got to be around for my part. She used the word y'all, so it's got to be. She's got to be Southwest somewhere. I love it. She says, "Hi, Chelsea." Hi, Chelsea. <laughs> uh, let's see. We got a LinkedIn user that said, "Great advice. Be our sister's brother's keeper. Check in on one another. Listen and love." Yeah, that and that that plays a big part. The the whole listening yeah. and loving, you know, being compassionate, being empathetic, uh, understanding that. And I was I was taught that in order to be uh, selfless, you have to be a little selfish, you know, and you have to know yourself first mm -hmm. you know, before you can go out and help everybody and conquer the world, uh, you know, one little step at a time, like we're doing here on, on this podcast and this live stream. But once you do that and you can look yourself in the mirror, understand your flaws and reach out for help, then you can go ask somebody else and, and give that hug and say, hey, I'm that shoulder to, to cry on. I'm the ear to listen to the voice for the voiceless. Um, right. It, it, it's it's great. And people are still coming in. Are you seeing an increase in PTSD this year? in 2020? Sadly, yes. Yeah. And 
one of the hardest things with that is that, um, you know, it's not just our first responders and, you know, veterans, right? It's like people, people who wouldn't normally expect it because they don't, they're being forced into this world that they have no clue how to navigate. And so, yeah, sadly that is. Right. And, and I would say, don't, don't be scared of that moniker, you know, the PTSD, because right. it's not always, it's not always PTSD. That's what I, I get to go speak to our rookie classes here. And I tell them right. you're going to experience trauma in your life, both yep. on the job and off the job. So just talking to somebody, you may have a little, just a little depression. You may just be, so just talking to somebody, I think some people think, well, I don't want to go. Cause they're going to say I have PTSD. Right. You know, so, but it's, it's an injury. It's a brain injury. It's just like hurting your leg. You have surgery, you go back to work. Like it's just an injury. In. Yep. Yeah. yep. Go and in. So I think everybody's so scared of being that PTSD, you know, right. especially that last word disorder. I you know. know. So yeah. Everybody, yeah. but it doesn't always, it doesn't mean just because you're struggling doesn't mean it's PTSD, but yep. I, I have seen an increase. With the current climate and everything that's going on right now for people not to be sustained experiencing bouts of severe anxiety even right yeah. well, yeah. The news and everything that's put out there and not knowing what to believe and what you know when's it all going to end but we're also yeah. sort of being forced into you know a, a degree of isolation as well um because of the pandemic and um it's, it's really really difficult times right now and unfortunately i don't think that we've seen the peak of yeah of the ptsd yeah. i think i think it's not going to come for months down the road uh if not just even a little after the first of the year even um that we're going to see some some spikes in number yeah I definitely think, um, one of the things chris i was curious uh, like what your response is to this so whenever i come in and i'm working like with all three shifts you know with within a fire department, one of my favorite things to really um, talk about is how one of our deepest things is that we want to be respected, right? Mm -hmm. And when we start to feel like we're no longer resilient and we actually find ourselves doing things we never thought we would do, the shame really sets in. You're like you, mm -hmm. you feel like you, you're no longer even being who you promised yourself that you would be. And how do you communicate that to the, your family and your kids, right? And, and, and rally them around. And so what I really try to foster people is like to do it from a place of um, power, do it from a place of empowerment. Mm -hmm. Like I would say to my kids, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling. I'm, I'm not hitting that mark the way that I used to be able to. And I'm sure it's apparent to you, but I really, I need you to hang with me through this for a while. Can you do that? You yeah. know, to come from that place of like, this is me and I know I'm missing. Can you, can you hang with me a little bit? And just asking someone to come alongside you that way can be so empowering instead of it coming from the like, oh, you know, I'm failing and I'm miserable and like, I know I'm failing, right? But come at it like, hey, this is me and I know I'm, I'm missing off. This is not firing right, you know? Right, right. Well, for me, I, I promoted early on the job, so I got to be a station officer for a long time. And I always had great working relationships with, with my guys and girls that were underneath me because, I don't know, I was just kind of, Lucy goosey, you know, I always want to be the center of attention, the funny guy, Mr. Humor. So, you know, so I, I felt like I had their respect. We all worked together, but I've had um, firefighters actually tell me they gained even more respect for me when I left the rigs for a while and I went away for treatment. And when I came back, the first thing I did when I got back to, I went to a different duty station for my last five years on the job, six years on the job. But first thing I did was said, you know, when you're gone for a while, everybody knows they want to know where, you know, it's, it's like a beauty shop, I guess. There's so many rumors around the fire department, you know, about what happened, where do you go? So I just pulled them all in there and said, hey, this is what happened. This is where I was. This is what I went through. Doesn't mean you're going to go through it, but if you do, I'm here for you. Right. And I think that I noticed my last five years on the job, too, that really opened up the door for if we did come back from a traumatic or critical call that we weren't near as hesitant to we firefighters still have their dark humor. That's how we break the ice. That's how we break the tension in the room. Yeah. But I noticed more once the tension was broke by the dark humor that 
we were willing to, you know, talk about if, you know, if you were struggling with it, if they needed to go, you know, maybe talk to somebody else or, you know, some of them, their best, they could go talk to their wife when they got home the next morning or need to call their wife. So, yeah, it's like you, you got to come from it from a place of not shame and guilt, but come from it from a place of empowerment and, uh, and say, you know, this is, this is what it was and this is how it is now. And so. I think that's how we change stigma, you guys. I think that that's how we can do this collectively, right? Mm -hmm. Is to come at it and say there, and like you'll see me, you know, when I'm in LinkedIn. I mean, every other post is, you know, when I battled suicidal ideation, I thought my kids were better off without me. You know, I believe <laughs> that to be so true to the yeah. core of my being, right? Right. And now I put it out there because I want people to identify. Like I believe that to be true. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're battling silently and you see me saying that, right, then you can look at us and say, wow, she made it through that, like, dark. And damn, it's dark. Right. And suicidal ideation, you know, it's right. a beast. It's a beast. Yeah. And I was the same way. I was the same way. I felt that if I wasn't here, that everybody could reset and start over. Yeah. Because I had, at, at the, when I got to that point, it wasn't even about the PTSD issues. It wasn't about the bombing and the photo from the bombing and the, and all the issues for the job and childhood events. It was now what was, what was destroying me inside was the way I had done my family and friends humiliated and, and alienated all my friends. That's why I didn't want to be here anymore. Yep. I was, I dealt with the other issues I was, but I had done so much damage to friends and family that I thought, okay, if I'm not here, they can reset yep. and start over and everything. So, yeah, she hit the nail on the head. Yeah, and a lot of people think that suicide is going to take the pain away, and all it really does is just transfers it onto all of the loved ones around you. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, it's just so admirable, Chris, what you're saying about coming back, what you came back from treatment, and being open about it, and telling everybody your experience and what you went away for. And I think that's like you were saying, Jennifer, where the shift happens and where we start to remove the stigma is people in those leadership roles using their positions to make sure everybody knows that it's not something to be ashamed of. There's no shame in it at all. It actually takes a, a heck of a lot of courage mm -hmm. to, to reveal those things and be vulnerable. And Chris and I, we've traveled around the country quite a bit and I've seen him speak and, you know, along with our, some other friends of ours that have, um, you know, stories with, you know, some going through struggles and the people afterwards that come up that talk to them and say that they have been having some having struggle, struggles too. And it was hearing them talk about it that gave them, you know, enough, uh, enough courage, like I was saying, to say something and take right. the ask for help. So it's, it was, it's pretty beautiful to see. Wow. It uh, is like, got... it's, it's such a, yep. Go ahead, Tracy. Jennifer. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, Chris, like you that's the thing, right? Like you know that power when you go in and you open up, you provide everybody else in that room permission to now, you know, do what you did. And so um it it's an it's an honor, you know, for me to to be able and you know, for myself personally, um, you know, having lost a, a husband and a child in a car crash, right? Um mm -hmm. When I'm when I come in and I'm speaking to police officers and firefighters, like to thank them for the job that they do, you know, they so often you guys see things and you never get to hear the other side of that story. And so a lot of times they're just like, thank you for coming back in and showing us this positive life on the other side. Right. And because you never get to see that sometimes. So. I agree. And that's, and that's a huge load on firefighters police officers too like you said we you make a car wreck and you know cut a 16 year old out of the car and well they you get them in the ambulance they go to the hospital well sometimes you get a follow-up sometimes you don't so you just don't you just like you said you don't get any kind of i don't like i don't like the word closure but you yeah. know what i mean like you said you're just kind of isolated from the outcome and so i'm, I'm sure it is when when people do stop by the station or by the police station fire station come in and say hey Thank you for being there because you were there. I'm here now. And so it is good to see the other side of the, of the trauma. Yeah. Well, and if I could foster anything, you guys, like with all of us, even with our kids, think about that with the police officers right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
who really says to them, you know, thank you for pulling me over. You know, thank you for X, Y, and Z because you know you you could have prevented so and so from doing something down down the way, right? Nobody really takes them for that job. And yet they do that day after day after day. Like yep. they're trained to watch people on how they're driving. And yeah, they pull us over for speeding or whatever, right? But that's because it, it could be indicative of something else. But nobody thinks right. of that, right? Right. So, I mean, what's happening right now, man? Whoo, you want to talk about lighting my fire, right? Yeah. I'm yeah. Just, did you see the car? Hello, like, would you really be doing this to someone, right? No, like, you clearly haven't thought this through. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Like, and and we got some more comments coming in. Uh, Tamara, Tamara Paris, uh, great idea. Seems our society stories everything in the negative. Yeah. Yes. yes, yes, that is true. Yeah. And then she also says, uh, many people self depreciate as leaders. We need to bring up and encourage more positive talk to one another. Mm -hmm. um thank and, you tomorrow. yeah thank yes. you tomorrow greatly appreciate yep. that Dan, 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 yeah well. change the stigma by loudly speaking your truth yeah which is so important speaking your truth yep. um Brittany, what's up Brittany? Hi, uh, Brittany. thanks Pretty for doing well. this uh we, we are here for you powerhouses both of them <laughs> Brittany and danielle are out there they're changing yeah world uh dr j allen wants to know is the stigma shirt available for purchase yeah dude <laughs> yeah uh, yeah i'll have to yes. i can what it is is it's a it's a gentleman i did a doctor in him kevin lynch who runs the quell foundation great foundation they address mental health for everybody first responders college student you name it um and that's kind of their, I think it even says quail on the back, just on a little okay. logo. But there is a website where you can go and order them. I'll get that information and put it out here in a minute. And I love yeah, I've, I've gotten, I've gotten tons of response from, from wearing this shirt. Well, and yes. it's perfect for something like this, right? Yeah. I, mean, I just, I absolutely yeah. love it. You know, yeah. yes, I had to awesome. have my wife wash it right before we try to put it on again. <laughs> it, lo it, it looks nice and crispy there, Chris. It, yeah. You know, <laughs> Chris. Might because it's a little snug. <laughs> yeah, uh, we got another comment coming in. Mr. Lewis, uh, police officers do not like to talk about the misery they have to deal with on a daily basis. Uh, he's a spe uh, speaking from experience. That is true. Uh, I do have a couple of um, cousins that are police officers, and they do not like to talk about what they go through or what they see. Uh, what they've actually had had to encounter and some of the things that they've dealt with. So uh, I totally ag agree. There's an element to that that is, you know, to me, it's resiliency. Okay. Because uh, when it came to like, when my daughter first passed away, I couldn't speak about you guys. I mean, you know, I'd sit up in my bed and scream. I had nightmares. Uh, I would throw up in public. You know, I had PTSD really, really bad, and I had to do EMDR kind of around it. Mm -hmm. But right around the five, six-year mark for me, I started speaking. And I felt sick. I felt sick. But I learned how to compartmentalize and how to be resilient. And I would talk to myself internally, and I would say, Jennifer, right now is not the time for you to break down. <laughs> Cause, Cause you have a job to do. And I would do Proven. that. Job. You know, I would do that job, but I would allow myself afterwards. Chris, can you hear me? Yes. You know? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, was that cut? You guys was that... for a little bit. So, oh, so my okay. challenge to the police officers out there is I respect the resiliency and the compartmentalization, right? Because that's what they have to do. But my challenge is, Yes, you do that while you're on the job. Yes, that's a part of being resilient. But when your body starts to show you that it can no longer keep every single one of those files packed away in there that you have so nice. I mean, your body is letting you know you got to do something. You, you have to, whether it's meditation, whether it's journaling, whether it's praying, whether it's medication, whatever. You have to do something. You can't just keep going. Mm -hmm. And that's does that make sense? Like, yeah, no, no, it, it does. I, totally. I respect that resiliency so much out of them because it's a, it's a trained thing. Mm -hmm. it's very Not, 
not everybody can do that, right? And so, and I, only, I only know that from experience. Like, I had to train myself how to take that and say, "Nope, I'm gonna put that somewhere so I can talk about this, and I'm gonna have to deal with it later." <laughs> so, yeah. And it's a tricky thing being a first responder and, and being put in those situations over and over again, because when you do experience trauma and your body or your brain goes into protective mode and the reasons why you're having the flashbacks, the night terrors, the memories and all of those things is because your, your brain's constantly trying to remind you of that event so that you don't put yourself in that situation again. Mm -hmm. First responders, that's their job is to put themselves in that position over and over again. And so it's, it's a really, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I wish that the public was more aware that, that that's the case. And I do think a lot of people just don't know yep. um, the, the compound trauma that is just, you know, over time and over the course of the careers. I mean, it just makes me have so much more respect uh, for, for everything that they do. And, you know, I have my own experiences from when I was younger that, you know, drive me a lot with, you know, the missions that I'm on, you know, and being a family member of, you know, military and first responders. And so, you know, I just, I really do wish that the public was educated a lot more. I think that there'd be a lot more support out there than. Yep. Well, this is a start right here. Yep. So oh, no doubt. Definitely. And then, you know, you, I, I found everybody here through a, a mutual friend and you know mutual friends so it it definitely to bring us all together and start talking about it and, and using this you know this medium to get out there aside from what you guys are doing it, it, it's it's great because the doors open for somebody to now come say hey i need to talk i need yeah. help i need yeah. assistance um got another comment coming through martial arts Nice. Up helping him while he was a police officer, Mr. Lewis. Thank nice. you for sharing that again. Yes. You know, to you get what. over some of that stuff, you know, to get over some of the things that you go through, you gotta, you know, get that release. Uh, you know, punching bag, working out, you know, exercising. I'm, I'm telling you, yeah, when I was hired, night, you tell me when I was hired in 1985 that you would see in 2020, you would see uh, four mats out in the rig room because guys are doing the yoga. <laughs> to relieve stress. I mean, that is a huge thing. Right. Uh, and, and there, and people aren't shy about participating in it. Yeah. And, uh, Don't I mean, it. Yeah, no, oh, well, it's, I've tried it and I was too sore afterwards. So, <laughs> but I'm just saying you, from the mentality I was raised on the job with yoga, you kidding me? Right. But people now they, I mean, they love it. There's people that are certified and to teach yoga to firefighters, I guess, uh, but it's just, it's crazy. Like you said, the martial arts is his release. Yep. Yoga. You got to you got. And like I said, that was one of the deals we talked about signs and symptoms. If you find that you're a used to person, you know, I used to play golf. I used to go fish. I used to do this. And you're not doing those things anymore. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. that's a pretty good sign. You know, those are things that you did to enjoy and release. And now you're not doing them and you got to get back to them. And his is martial arts. So it's perfect. Yeah. And I could see how that would be helpful. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you're probably can get out a lot of a lot of stress through through activities like that. Yep. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So how does one build and, and you know, each, each of y'all have had, uh, experiences, uh, but how did you build the courage to tackle and overcome those dark hours, those dark places? How, how would you, how have you, how have you guys built the courage to go on and, and continue to succeed? while being in a dark place uh go ahead jennifer <laughs> you know you guys um like i kind of started for people who are like just jumping in um i was a young mom i had three little girls and when i battled suicidal ideation i pulled out everything that i knew i had gone to the doctor uh, i was trying medication i was seeing a counselor I could not figure out why I was battling suicidal ideation. I couldn't figure it out, right? Um, one day I was going to, I picked my girls up from school mm -hmm. and I had the thought to just go ahead and end it mm -hmm. with my girls in the car. And that was the day that I was like, I'm done. 
I, I'm no, I've battled this. I've done everything I know. And so I walked myself into the psychiatric unit. I learned so much shit in the psychiatric unit. And it's a part of what I bring into my courses and my book and my coaching, right? Because I'm like, I want to help prevent you from ever having to get to that place, right? Right. But here's the thing, you guys. After I left the psychiatric unit and my life was starting to turn around, my husband and daughter were killed. And it, it's been 16 years that I have wrestled with grief and depression and anger and all those things, right? But nothing, nothing touches that one year span of suicidal ideation, nothing. Right. Not even the grief of losing my daughter touches that because in the darkness of suicidal ideation, it's like I was walking around in the shell of a body. And so, you know, my plea is like, don't go that long, please. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with the depression, if you're struggling with relationships, things are starting to break down at home. Like, go now. Talk now. Do it now. Does that make sense? Do not wait any longer until you're at that ledge where I was. Right. Because it's, it's so hard to turn that around when you're there, right? So, I mean, you asked me, how did I do it? I did it because I chose to lock myself up long enough until my mind could be fixed. I realized in the psychiatric unit that I had thyroid disease, that I had no estrogen in my body, and that I had not slept well for two years. Wow. When I fixed the sleeping, the thyroid, and the estrogen, my mind came back. And it is because I had that mind that I was clear when my husband and daughter were killed. I knew, I knew that I needed to put that oxygen mask on myself if I wanted to save my other two daughters. I knew it. Right, yeah. right. And, and I think what's important, what she's, one thing I picked up was she didn't, she didn't give up, you know, and I know so many guys and, and girls that I've talked to and they go to talk to one counselor and that counselor, they didn't hit it off that counselor, they give up, I'm done. Yep. You know, you can't do that. There's, it's almost like a relationship. There's actually somebody for everybody. Mm -hmm. and so, and it's the same way with the, for, with the counseling, uh, just because you and one don't hit it off, you know, and don't mesh, you know, mine was, I did, I went to a, like a family counselor first and you know, that nobody that had anything to do with first responders, they knew anything about PTSD. So I just kind of, I relied on my doctor giving me the Xanax and stuff for, you know, my anxiety and stuff. And, and my, my choice was I tried a little cocktail of alcohol and pills and uh, for me, you know, and when it didn't work, but, but that's how selfish I got to be. I thought, well, if I kill myself by this, they'll think it was just an accident. Mm -hmm. I don't want them thinking Chris Fields was a bad person that couldn't handle his stuff. It was an accident. He didn't mean to, but the important thing for me was getting with somebody that understood where I was coming from. It doesn't have to be another first responder. There's therapists that all they deal with is PTSD and first responders. But it was big for me to get with somebody that understood where I was coming from. Yep. And somebody that knew where I needed to go next. And I'm like her for EMDR. Mm -hmm. Say it. I know there's a lot of people that, you know, the psychotherapy, there's a lot of people that don't. But I'm just telling you. And that's another thing I don't like when people. What works for me may not work for you. Hey. I a love, counselor that works for me may not work for you. I love empowering people to find out like, what is it for you? You know, I had this right. list and it's like, which of these have you tried? What worked, what didn't, right? Like, let's not give up till we find what works for you. Like, it's and, and that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If you go to one counselor and y'all don't hit it off and that you don't think they're getting where you're coming from and yep. that, you know, uh, you know, if I'd have, well, I did give up after my first one. That's why I got to where I got to. Right. But that's my, just what you said. My main message now when I like to, when I speak is out of anything, you don't have to wait till you're at rock bottom. Yeah. If you'll do it early, you don't have to, you don't have to go through all the pain and humiliation that you serve on your family and alienate your name from friends and uh, family. Yep. You can uh, stop it before it gets that far. And that's what, that's my main message is you don't have to wait until, you know, you have no choice. Yep. Yeah. And it's amazing how long people will sit in their suffering. Yep. You know, yeah. and I know I've gone through my bouts of depression and 
having some suicidal ideation. It's so hard for me to talk about. I don't really, <laughs> I haven't really ever, I think, talked about it openly, um, just with close friends and whatnot. But um, I've experienced a lot of loss in my life in different um, times in my life, going through different levels of abuse and psychological, emotional, physical, all of those things. And it just gets to a point where, you know, you start to feel a little worthless or like you would be better off not being around. I've had similar thoughts, you know, where I'm like, maybe if I'm just driving and just go right off the overpass, you know, and it looks like an accident maybe, but um, I've, I've experienced those thoughts as well. And I think just having a purpose, mm -hmm. what, I'm doing, what I'm doing right now, like that means everything. Mm -hmm. to me. Knowing that I can be there and help other people that are struggling and going through things means everything to me. Like I would not rather be doing anything else. So right. I'm so happy to have met, you know, Chris several years ago when we were doing a training in Oklahoma city and, you know, being able to, um, you know, to go around places with him and meet people and hear their stories. And when I have those thoughts, I think about those people and I'm going, you know, there are a lot of organizations that are around these days, but they're still not enough. So, mm -hmm. right. yeah. I don't want to remove myself <laughs> being somebody, somebody that person. Yeah, is. we need you. We need right. you. Right. Yeah. 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 And you guys too. So I yeah. think that's I, what I, I, drives, pulls me out right. of those, my, those thoughts and those moments is knowing mm -hmm. that, you know, I've had people, I've been the difference for someone and I, you know, I would mm -hmm. like to do that again. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah. Well, just think, I mean, even you like posting and inviting you know, like you did, you know, this is your first podcast, like you're rocking it. <laughs> and, you know, like we have no idea who's listening to this. We have no idea. Right. And just the impact of this. That's what I told you earlier, Pedro. Right. It was yeah. like, I'm yeah. like right. the power of us tonight. We have no idea. And I've just really learned to trust that, you know. Exactly. Right. And, and Chelsea made a comment about how she looks at our story sometimes to say, OK, you can overcome it. A good friend of mine, shows named Jay Dobbins. He's always talks about how he looks to other people for inspiration. Yeah, he looks at other stories. So I'm a big. I, I find podcasts now that are positive. You know, something like this even that are, has sends a positive message. Overcoming stories. Mm -hmm. um, I use. I'm gonna use your story now, Jennifer. Thank you from now on. It's an amazing story. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's there's several people that I've some close with after the the bombing that had, mm -hmm. that were trapped for six, eight, nine hours and the things they're doing today are just, and I'm thinking, okay, Chris, you're having a bad day. And I can look at what they overcame and think, okay, I can get through this. Cause I still have days. I still have bad days, but, but, but I can look to, but yeah. I, I constantly, I look to other people for, for inspiration sometimes. And it is it's as simple as if they can do it, I can do it. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, and thank you all for sharing those, those beautiful stories and, and, the power and empowering stories that you have behind you and how you're willing to help. we got some more comments coming in. Uh, Danielle, you're so thank strong you, and inspir inspir inspiring, Jennifer. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, Mr. Lewis again. Jennifer, your strength is amazing. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer is getting all the love tonight. <laughs> uh, she deserves Posse, it. Posse, Uncle Pedro, Aunt Chelsea, Uncle Chris, and Aunt Jennifer. Look at that. Uh, Good friend, Mr. Kurt Brandon, said Chris hit the nail on the head. Uh, yep. Thank you, Mr. Kurt. I did. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, Red yes. Laces, Jonathan, he said, agree, Jennifer, empowering is a vocabulary that we definitely need to use spot on. Um, over at Safety FM, one of the questions, what are your thoughts about people who don't want to discuss this matter because of the level of shame that comes with this subject matter? Just find that safe outside. Just find that safe outside person because a lot of times the shame that comes is really fear. Mm -hmm. You right. know, a lot of times it's the fear of like, I'm going to lose my job or I'm going to lose respect or whatever. And so just find that outside safe place because there's like people like me who like to talk about the shit. All right. <laughs> You know, the more that we talk about it and let people know that there are actually people out there. Um, I don't know if you guys have met or even know of like um, Shauna Springer, but she is amazing in the veteran world. And she has just spent a decade 
work with our veterans and um, the veterans, you know, love her because they know that she gets it. And that, I think that that's it, right? Like you want to talk with someone who gets it, not someone who doesn't make it better. Yeah. Right. Well, too, that people would be really surprised. I think there's a lot of fear of shame mm -hmm. talking about it, but I think people would be really surprised at how much love they're how they're actually met with. Right. Right. You know, that's, and that's how, what shot me. how much, <laughs> like, you know, we were saying before how much um, that they would inspire someone else or, you know, bring that courage up for someone else to, to talk about issues that they're having as well. Right. But right. Surprised really how much love that they'd be met with. Right. And, and his question, you know, and part of it sounds harsh, but then part, you know, the first part sounds kind of harsh is it's almost like it's with anything. It's with, anything if it's an addiction thing you can't make them yeah. and that's that's me you know i pushed away so many people until i wanted to do it mm -hmm. it was you know it wasn't going to be done that was just the way it was right. and, and so people get that mindset but you just have to be there for them just like she said i think jennifer said just to listen you're not you're not there to say right wrong this is what i would do this is how i would handle it they don't you just want to listen and and that was what was impressive for me when I finally reached out for help. And I think I use this quote in my bio, even I was shocked at the amount of people that were reaching out, reaching back to help me. Mm -hmm. And it was the people that I had humiliated and alienated myself from that were trying to help me in the beginning. Those were the ones that were still there for me. The ones that were telling me everything I wanted to hear when I was not doing things right, not being the father or the husband or even the friend I should be. Those people were nowhere to be found when I finally reached out for help, but it was the very people that I had alienated and humiliated that were right there waiting to take me back in with open arms. So you can't force anybody, mm -hmm. but all you can do is be there for them, encourage them and just listen. Don't even have to give an answer. Just listen. Yes. And Chris, wouldn't you, wouldn't you guys agree? Like for me, even when I share my story now, I don't want pity. Mm -hmm. No. I don't, I don't want your pity. I just want your respect for my journey. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want when we can pity. see other people, you know, through that empowering and with respect, just whether you've done awful things or not, right. Respect for your journey. Right. Right. Like I, I don't want your pity. <laughs> I had enough self pity, so I don't need any more. You know, I definitely don't yeah. need judgment either. I mean, when people yeah. judge me, like they if they walk in on like a page, you know, and they're like, "Oh my God, look at her!" And I'm like, "Really? You're gonna judge right. me in this chapter in this line, right?" Like, I don't want judgment either, but I definitely don't want your pity. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. That's perfectly said. Red laces. So oh. grateful to you all for sharing these deeply personal experiences uh it's definitely part of our wider mission to create the environment where everybody will be feel feel able to open up uh we're making it normal to talk about the mental health which then removes the stigma thank you red laces for that yeah great right. and, and I've, I've seen that that even corporations now are forming peer support teams at you know at corporations and and businesses and stuff like that which i, I love that because it's not just for first response PTSD isn't just for first responders and military and military veterans and it's for every day I mean it affects every day people yes. yeah. you know anybody that I would never call anybody a liar unless they come up tell me they've never experienced any trauma in their life and everything's great and beautiful that is not true so I think it's I think it's a huge step I see some of these corporations and stuff you know, uh, forming peer support teams and stuff for for people at work Oh yeah, definitely. Kurt Brandon, again, great set guys. I love this. Greatly appreciate it. That's why we do this. Yep. Um, Tamara Paris again, Tamara, it has been a social belief for many decades, not to share <laughs> what you're feeling, uh, that you're feeling depressed. This impact impacts people feeling comfortable with sharing and talking about it. Uh, this is where the shame feeling comes from. Mm -hmm. Uh, we totally agree. And then the next that, that is true. Up, yeah. This is also a big difference of acceptance through different generations. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, my, right. mama, my mom and dad, right? Exactly. And like my age, I was like, I am breaking that. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you know, that's that's me. I was I was brought up on the fire department and that well, even when I was raised as a kid, I was in that suck it up era, you know. Yeah. Suck it up and go on. It didn't matter if it was athletics, you got hurt. Well, if you come out, somebody's gonna take your spot. I mean, yeah. that was just you suck it up and you go on down the road. And that's the way I was brought up on the fire department by these old grizzly smoke eaters that didn't wear masks into fires. And yeah. if they did, I've had some that would after the fire and we're doing work with their smoke, they're smoking a cigarette. I mean these tough grizzled guys and I feel sorry for them because they did they was never ruled a suicide but I know so many of them that after they retired yeah. drank themselves to death right. because they didn't have the avenues we have now and the access we have now yeah. and you know I know some that if they knew I was crying when I was telling my story they'd kick my ass because that was unacceptable yeah. but uh you can ask Chelsea I'm a I will cry all over you when I get going and it's I'm just it's something I just learned to say I just I'm learned to say let, I, 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 yeah, I spoke to him one time and this guy, he, he spoke before me. He kept saying, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to cry. I'm sorry. He kept apologizing. And the first thing I told him, I said, dude, you have, you don't ever apologize. And I used to be in that boat. I said, you don't ever apologize for, for, for those emotions. That is so, I mean, it's just, I don't know. I, but I see things changing so much that it, it's, it's, it's good. There's still a long ways to go. By no way are we even at the top of the hill on the downhill side, no. but we are gaining ground. Yeah. Oh, Marcus, I, know, you know, I, I rarely get through something without, without some tears. So I'm true. <laughs> this is, this will be, this is a first. Mr. Lewis never told anybody this. I needed to talk to an outsider counselor about issues I was dealing with in the police department. Uh, I was working at, as I was speaking to the counselor about my feelings <laughs> in the office, dude fell asleep. I couldn't believe it. My solution, I started to train harder, and that helped. Wow. Uh, again, thank you all for doing this. More folks need to be here. Uh, thank yes, you. definitely. Uh, our, our, our next roundtable or mental health awareness, uh, you know, uh, we might end up opening it up and have everybody that wants to come in, uh, you right. know, have a have a big, big powwow. So, right, and, and everybody's got – Everybody's got a story. Oh, yes. That's yes. what I tell some of these people that get on peer support teams. Because I know in the firefighter world, if somebody's on a peer support team, these young rookie guys are, and girls are thinking, oh, that person's got it all together. They're solid. That's why they're on the peer support team. That's why I tell them, peer support team, if you've got a story to tell, tell that story. Yes. You'll gain so much more respect. That way they're looking at, I'm not on a peer support team, but they look at Chris Fields on the peer support team. He told his story. He's felt and been where I've been mm -hmm. because like I said, a lot of time these people on these teams and, and these clinicians, and these counselors get looked at like they've got everything together. That's why they're where they're at. And so it's just important that, like you said, open it up to people. If they got a story to tell, mm -hmm. tell it. Cause you, somebody, somebody needs to hear it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, and we learn, you know, cause not everybody's story is going to be, it, it, it's, it's going to be different. It's not going to be the same. We all have different right. walks of life that we and trials and tribulations that we've been through. And, and, you know, speaking of my own, you know, trauma that I've been through recently had a heart attack at, at 36. I was a heavy smoker and just, you know, coming off of that and, and it, it, it that bright light at the end of the tunnel. And <laughs> I had to turn away and run away from it because it, it wasn't my time yet. Again, I have my daughters and that experience there has uh, definitely opened up my eyes a lot more to how I have to be towards everything that I'm tackling, you know, from okay. being a workaholic and finally saying, you know what, work can stay at work. I need to focus on my marriage. I need to focus on my kids uh, to then bringing that to work and saying, hey, I'm here to help everybody that I can while I'm on the job site. So it's, it's right. definitely one of those things where if you have a story, we would definitely like to hear it. Right. And like I say, and, and just what you just said, that's important to somebody because there's somebody struggling with trying to quit smoking. Yep. There's somebody that's has a horrible relationship because of work or, you know, something. So just to see where you're at now and you can tell that story. And like I say it may not be on a stage or it may not be traveling to the country, you know, but it's, it's a story that somebody can take something from it and apply it to their life. Yeah. They can relate Tom to tomorrow again, break it wide open. Not a health decade. Yep. Don't show your hurt. Uh, uh, Kurt, rub some dirt on it, walk it off. That's the era we were raised in. Yep. And then yeah. Yeah. the military. Embrace the um, yeah. Mr. Lewis, he can relate to what Chris, Chris is saying. Brush <laughs> yourself off, get back in there. Yeah. Uh, it definitely is. Um, 
how you were raised and being in the military, me being in the military, you know, you, you were taught not to show emotion. You took your orders, whether you get hurt, you, you know, again, rub some dirt, get back in there and do what you have to do. Um, but nowadays you, you can't do that. You have to no. let that go and actually open up and be able to talk about what's bothering you because, uh, you'll feel that much better when you talk about it when you're able and sometimes that's maybe all you need that yeah. Yeah. exactly that might be the, the you know the turning point to say okay now i can talk about it i'm much stronger it empowers me to be able to give you know my thoughts and what's been bottled up inside and now mm -hmm. hey i can embrace it and right help somebody else yeah, that's yeah. A lot of, it's a lot of weight to carry around so oh, no doubt i think that that's is so big you guys it's like you know, yesterday was the 16 year anniversary of my husband and daughter passing away. And I had to give myself permission. To, you know, I wept all day. Mm -hmm. I felt like right. all day I was reliving these torturous emotions mm -hmm. that day, right? Yeah. Right. But I allowed myself to feel it. Like I was even like, shit, my eyes are going to be swollen tonight for this thing because I cried <laughs> so much yesterday, right? Right. But that's my that's my truth and i want to i want to feel it i miss her i miss my daughter right. so much it's not funny right right and i have learned how to say okay now wrap that back up that's package it emdr is huge right yeah. right and when i'm ready to take my britney beautiful back out and weep all day again i'll do it right, <laughs> right? right. and that's that's what's important don't don't yes. Don't try not to feel those emotions. Yes. And, you know, that's, that's, so that's, that's you huge, man. That's beautiful. You can yeah. learn to be resilient in the way that you have been. You can also learn how to feel, feel deep, mm -hmm. and wrap it back up and put it back away. You can. I, I think people confuse resiliency with no emotions, nothing right. affects me. That's right. not resiliency. That's a robot, you know? <laughs> I mean, so I think yeah, people sometimes. Never feel right. Like yeah. Right. Yeah, you want to feel that's what helps you. You know, I have days where, especially if I run into some of those people that I said I use for inspiration, you know, or I have a few triggers still, you know, from the day of the bombing and some other incidents on the job. But like I say, I don't, I don't try to, I just have my bad day. And when I'm done with it, I move on, you know? Yep. So, got you. Danielle, Danielle, she's been lighting up the chat. The tears are all the years of repressed trauma coming out. Um, no doubt. Definitely. Uh, Kurt Brannon, again, a real man does not only show his emotions and feelings, he shows other men that it's okay to do the same. Ooh, ooh, Great words, my man. Great words, yep. Kurt. Yeah. Yep. Chris, leading the way. Mr. Lewis, Pedro, take care of yourself. Thanks, Thank you. Lewis. Thanks Thank for you, Lewis. Me. I greatly appreciate it. I am. Uh, I know my daughters have been holding me accountable for taking my medications and, uh, you know, they keep asking me, have you smoked a cigarette today? No, nope, I have not smoked a cigarette. And, uh, you know, being a safety professional uh, and a smoker, it, it, it didn't really go together. Uh, but again, being in the military and I've, I, I've been smoking, you know, a long time, it definitely opened up my eyes and I have, you know, I have not picked up a cigarette since that last day I smoked one. So it's well, been, about, it's been about two months. Daughter. Sorry, not to cut you off. From your daughter's perspective, um, that's what my dad passed away from. And I was I was 11 and he was 42. Mm. So. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm chewing a lot of gum. I'm working out. I'm doing, you know, more <laughs> podcasts and live streams. And so it's definitely, you know, um, helping me out. And them keeping me accountable and just knowing that, you know, what, what my truth is and how I can be able to bounce back from that and, um, you know, become better, be, be a better dad, a better husband, uh, a better person in general. Right. Kurt, Kurt, my man, turn your weaknesses into strengths, build your armor with them so they can no longer harm you. Then teach someone else how to build their armor. Amen, yep. brother. I, I second that right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another LinkedIn user, wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, I know everybody's seen that it's been watching, has been uh, lighting us up in the chat. We're going to have a little giveaway here on this live stream. Um, 
Jennifer, what, what are we giving away, Jennifer? Yeah, I'm just so excited, you guys. I'm about ready to publish version 2.0 of my book. So three years ago, I wrote a book. It was called Inside the Mind of Suicide. And it's a self-help workbook. But what I discovered was that a lot of people would pick up the book. <laughs> and there's this very distraught looking woman, which was me. And I'd just gotten off of a panel of speaking about suicide. Anyway, the book is so much more than just about suicide. It's about grief and, you know, fighting like hell for yourself. Like you said, you know, when the first counselor doesn't work, Chris, right? Like you go find another one. And so the book is really about strategies and solutions on how to build uh, resiliency. So um, cleaned it up, edited it up, changed the cover. So yeah, um, I would love to gift one of our listeners tonight a copy of uh, my newest book that's set to come out here like within a week. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, and, and we'll announce the winner at the end of the show. Yeah. But along with that, you also get an X Factor of Safety goodie a coffee cup. We got some stickers and a t shirt. Wait, Just wait, can some... I win? Yes, I'm a, I'm, I'm a listener. <laughs> you joined that contest. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so we'll, we will definitely pick a winner here in, uh, in the next uh, half hour or so. Uh, so stay tuned. Send in your questions. Uh, we definitely want to hear from you. Um, so what are some of the harmful effects of, and, and I, I don't want to say harmful, um, some of the effects of traditional treatment, i.e., you know, drugs to help the mental illness versus not using the, you know, finding another means. Uh, do you recommend going with, you know, some type of medication or... Do you look somewhere, somewhere else? Oh, I definitely want to take that one on. <clears throat> yes, okay. definitely. Okay. So here's my thing. Medication itself, like, you know, through the primary care physician, um, great for short term, right? If you've got someone who is on the ledge, it's like triage, right? You got, you cut the arm, you go in, what do they do? I mean, they give you some pain medication, they fix it up, right? So medication, like from your doctor, pulling it out firsthand, absolutely. But then that person has to really evaluate for themselves whether it's a good fit for them long term or not. And Chelsea, you know, I know that you've got some alternative solutions. The thing about alternative solutions mm -hmm. is, is, you know, they don't work for everyone else. They take a little bit longer to get into your system, whatever, right? So again, my answer is that that person needs to really navigate what's the best for them. And yeah. right. So yeah. for me, for me, I'm, I'm running strong, you guys, on 16 years. And I take amitriptyline every single night, 50 milligrams. And I. Oh. Can you hear me? 16 years strong. And that's, okay. you know. I take my thyroid and my amitriptyline every single night. Um, th that's even after brain surgery. So, you know, um, I tried the whole like CBD, taking it under my tongue. It just doesn't help me. Right. So, some people. Right. Right. So some it, some it does. Some it does. Exactly. To me, I'm like no shame. Right. If it works for you, sweet. Right. 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 right? So yeah, I like I know you and I um, connected a little bit because I was checking out your website. So yeah, I want to hear a little bit more about. I think Pedro's hollering at us if we can hear him or not because we lost his live. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, can, I can hear you guys. I, I just okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Away really well, okay, I'm actually here. I'm actually hearing you better now. Yeah. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, yeah. and um, you yeah, know, to what Jennifer was saying, I think that it really is. You know, you have to go with. You, you know, your best advice from who you're seeking, who you're seeking the advice from. But um, also, you know, I, Jennifer and I spoke at length about what we do with Peak One Wellness and making sure that, yes, if you are recommended medication, that you're on the right medication for you. And so, um, you know, there, there are different ways you can do that. There's a test called a pharmacogenetics test that we offer 
uh, or that we're going to be offering once we get fully launched um, that tells you what medications are right for you based on your your DNA. It's how you metabolize certain medications to make sure you're not having, you know, uh, adverse reactions to them or, uh, and things like that. And especially for first responders, it's even, you know, even more important that they have access to that so that it's not going to affect the, the way they're able to do their job on duty. Um, so, yeah, Jennifer and I are going to be maybe working on some things <laughs> to, to, to push it's that forward. You know, we've got to find a solution. So, again, if, if you know, I've worked with firefighters, you guys, who are sitting up in the middle of the night in the bed screaming from flashbacks and nightmares and the tones and the sounds, you know, like, no, we've got to triage that right away, right? Yeah. But once we can kind of triage that situation, and you shouldn't be penalized for that. But then if you can come in and provide something that helps them when they're not on shift, whatever it is, right? right? These are all things. These are a part of the solution that we have to not only just talking about these things, right? But we have to bring real solutions to things yeah. that you guys can do that will help you keep your job. Yeah. And um, it's just, it's so important that we have these conversations, you know, because right. so like I was saying to you, I'm, I'm running strong on amitriptyline, right? I don't know if you guys have heard of amitriptyline, but it's one of the oldest antidepressants, 50 milligrams. They take it at night. It has the least side effect, right? It's not a, it's not a ambient, right? Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if someone's not sleeping on shift or off, yeah, we've got to help them sleep. So yeah, I can't wait to hear more about, you know, the stuff that you've got and, and just what you guys are doing. Like yeah. And I think too, if you're going to seek help, if you're going to a doctor to try to see if they can help you or um, provide some solutions for you, just making sure that they're doing a really thorough assessment. So they have all the information possible um, to, to get the best, um, you know, plan in place for you. That's super, super important. And, you know, unfortunately not, not all physicians out there, um, you know, get that thorough and make sure that they, they look at everything, but they, a lot of it plays in um, to the mood and anxiety, depression, all of that with your hormone levels. So there's, there's a lot that goes into that. And at peak one, you know, we're working with a, a national laboratory uh, to to have that available for first responders all across the country, uh, their family members as well, because they experience secondhand trauma in a lot of cases from what, what they deal with and what they go through. So yeah, we're excited to to get that moving forward. And that's such a big piece, you guys, right, Chris? It's like, oh. you know, yeah. if, you know, not only talking about what's going on, but if you're having real issues, right? Like yeah. you're not, you can't sleep, you're sitting up, you're having triggers, all of those things. Even navigating how to have that conversation with your doctor so that it's not written down, that it's right. like, now you're going to lose your job, over, right? Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Right. And you're hitting a you're hitting a big thing that's very important. You're talking about losing your job. The fact that you're getting to go talk to firefighters is is a good thing because it starts at the top with these organizations, whether it's a corporation or a police department or fire department. It has to start at the top with the chief or the CEO or whoever to let people know that mm -hmm. they understand it's okay not to be okay. Why wouldn't they? Once you healthy, they get yeah. better work out of you. Number one, I was on a show last night with a chief from California named Neil gang. He made me want to go get back on the job as a policeman and work for him. I mean, yeah. this, this guy was a stud talking about taking care of his people. And and there's a majority of them are like that, but there are some, and they, yeah. they shake their head at the mental health. They don't want anybody in there putting, right. speaking to their people, putting any thoughts that you could have mental health problems. I've been, I've, I've, I had a speaking deal canceled because the fire chief didn't want his employees to hear oh my goodness. anything. I mean, right. so it was just, it's just crazy, but you, you, that was a good point about people scared about losing their job, but it, uh, yeah. you know, it starts at the top. Yeah. And that's another thing. Uh, the reason why we structure the, the company the way that it is with our assessments is we're doing everything cash pay as well. So we're not going through insurance where it's going to be recorded. Um, you know, if somebody goes to, to you know one of the locations to get some of the testing done they go right into the portal and they check their results and they view them so it's not going to be you know on record on insurance or something that's going to follow them around which is great 
So nice. then we've negotiated, you know, some really good rates for that. And, but yes, shout out to Neil. Neil's fantastic and he's really <laughs> progressive and he cares so much about making sure that Very his, good. yeah, that his dep department members are healthy and that he's able to spread, you know, that attitude and that mindset around. He's, he's great. Right. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Another, another red laces comment. It's often said not to hang out with negative people. It's also said to be supportive of those who need help. Is it a contradiction? Are such labels helpful in 2020? You know what, Red Laces? Mm -hmm. That top one, which says don't hang out with negative people. Oh, it makes me so mad. Yeah. It makes me so mad because PTSD, you know, like I have literally had people say to me, you know, the fact that you talk about your depression, Jennifer, the fact that you talk about that you're sad or that you wept yesterday, right? It's like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm really sorry that that appears to be negative to you, but like, that's my reality. There's a right. difference between being a Debbie Downer, right? There's a difference right. between me being like, oh, yesterday, you know, and like, ah, oh, and then me talking about a real negative thing, right? And so when people say hang around positive people, yeah. I, I've had people like tell me I'm a negative person because I talk about my real negative life. I'm like, well, I'm really sorry. Yeah, like, no kind of, you know, that's yeah. my reality. <laughs> yeah. They got, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I, mean, yeah. I, I think it's important. I mean, why wouldn't you want to be around negative people and, and spread your positive light, your positive story? I mean, yeah, that makes no sense to me. Right. But do you see the difference about talking oh, about yeah. real, like real, yeah. and it's negative. But, you right. know, I'm, I'm always looking for the light in the negative, right? Like right. I'm always, I'm always looking for that light, but I don't walk around this like, yeah, you know, woe is me. Yeah. <laughs> woe is me, but I'm also not like, you know, hmm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? I yeah. mean, yeah. So, no, it definitely it, it definitely is um, you know important to not say negative people because again yes. those you know negativity and they're having those negative thoughts doesn't mean that they're negative they're just probably going through some crap right so you uh, definitely have to be there and you know put yourself in in in, in their shoes and kind of embrace what they're going through and that's where you know I refer back to being empathetic and being able to say hey. I know what you're going through. I know, you know, life is rough right now. How can I help? How can I right. take a burden off of your shoulders? How can I help bring some brightness to your darkness, um, you know, to make it better? So it, it definitely um, will will help and not the thing, negative you know, people. The thing is, is like, you know what? We're not all cut out to be the ones that hear that stuff. And if that's not you, that's okay. Right. You know, if, if, you, if you say honestly to someone like, wow, man, I'm just kind of in my own negative space right now. I'm really sorry. Like, I can't take on anymore. That's OK. Right. right. There's mm -hmm. plenty of us who are out there who can take it on. Right. 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 But, but don't shut the person down and tell them, you know, oh, be. It'll all be better. Like, no, if they're if they're bringing that out, if you're not the one to hear it, that's fine. But. You know, yes, I do. I mean, I, I don't know what's asked, made him ask that question about, is that a contradiction? Yes. Our society is like basically saying, you know, don't be negative. It's like, um, I didn't get to choose those thoughts that are going off inside my head. Right. Right. Anybody want to help me sort through that, please? Yeah, exactly. Right. Help me go through this. So that way I know I'm not alone. Yeah. You know? and, and that's yeah. where, you know, being, being that, you know, the empathetic open arms, open ears, being able to listen to somebody will go a long way and go a long, a, a longer way with people that are, you know, troubled right now, especially yep. in this, in this day and age, in this time that we're in crazy 2020, um, <sighs> Tony Taylor, he mm -hmm. agrees with what, you know, red laces had said and loves this conversation. Sweet. Tony, my man, I love you. So Pedro, <laughs> do you want me to, um, like, uh, pick a random number? Is that how we're going to do it? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, we're, yeah, yeah. We're gonna pick a random number. Okay. Uh, and, and Jennifer's gonna pick it, and this is for her book and the X Factor Safety coffee cup, T-shirt, and some stickers. 
Um, okay, so give me a number between one and what, and then I'm going to just give you a random number. Uh, between one and 40. One and 40. And again, I can't see anything, so I'm going to do, let's see here, um, 33. Hey, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, 33. Okay, so... Who? Oh, look at that, Tony. I love you too, brother. Uh, number thirty-three. And see, nobody picked it, and we we got to pick again. I, we got we let everybody okay. know too preemptively. So now send in your numbers one through I can't, forty. I can't, I can't see anything. Yep. So send me your numbers in the comments, uh, one through forty, and Jennifer's gonna pick a number, and whoever's closest, you win the book and the extra safety goodie goodie bag. So. Coming back to these uh, comments, Mr. Lewis, going to talk to somebody about uh, whatever's going on with you is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. Just my opinion. And yep. he also said that he remembers hearing stories years ago uh, about police officers not going to talk uh, to a shrink for fear of losing their job. Oh, that's such a big one, you guys. I mean, that's as a coach, still out there, yeah. As oh, yeah. a coach, that you know, I stay busy because people reach out to me to help them navigate how to keep their job and actually help themselves. Like, right. so we need more. A, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, um, I'm looking for coaches who want to, you know, partner with me because I can't right. keep on everyone that reaches out. <laughs> right. And, and it's also the fact that, and I think it's an important gap that's actually being bridged right now is that relationship between first responders and clinicians. I yeah. use the word clinician just to, for everybody in that group. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because that's always, like you said, it's always been associated with crazy dudes on the couch talking to somebody, you know, I mean, right. so there is, there's, there's so many wonderful, wonderful people out there. Yep. And it's just an important, you know, gap that's got to be bridged. And, and, I, and it is being bridged between first responders and, and clinicians. So. Yeah. Well, there are a lot more cl clinicians out there making sure to, um, be prepared to right, right. Be first responders, and, and you I finally get clinicians that aren't. Many stories too with from other first responders going to see someone who maybe isn't used to seeing first responders, and you know they'll exactly. start crying in the middle of the session or something like that, and which just sets them back even further because then they have that guilt that they're going to be passing on or they're going to be harming the other person by telling some of these stories and they're going to traumatize them during a session. So, um, I, I know quite a few Jennifer, I'll help. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Together. <laughs> I can think of a, a few off the top of my head. Thanks. Yep. Okay. So uh, looking at the chat, uh, we got, we got quite a few numbers in there. So, okay. Uh, here, again, you want again, me to one? One, one through 40. So, all right. Uh, my next number is three. Next number is three. Let's see. <laughs> okay. Mr. Lewis. Bam. Number one. He got the closest. Yay. Mr. Lewis. <laughs> Greatly appreciate it. Uh, if you if you could be so kind uh, as to um, shoot me your address and we will get you all your goodies. Mr. Lewis, uh, you can shoot it to um, xfactorofsafety at gmail.com. Uh, and that way I'll be able to, you know, get get that coordinated with Jennifer and we'll be we'll be, be able to get you your book and uh, the the goodie, the X Factor Safety goodie bag. Nice. No. So um, I love your flag. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, it's got. It's got the all the colors. colors. Yeah, it's got yeah. all the colors. I love We're that. We're local that makes them for us. If anybody wants one of these too, um, <laughs> I have someone who who hand makes these. Nice. Yeah, they can do. They can even do like logos on them. You could get one that says X Factor of Safety if you want it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you I'm, can do like a logo on the corner or something. Nice. I'm still trying to find the <laughs> web address for this shirt. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Mr. Lewis, he said, because he's number one. I know. Uh, Danielle, good job, Lewis. Thank you for listening, Danielle. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank everybody for listening. Yeah. 
you know, we, we greatly appreciate all the comments that we had come through, all the listeners Absolutely. and viewers that were out there. Uh, and again, this will be out on YouTube uh, after I post edit everything. And then as well, we will make this into a podcast. Nice. And put it on, uh, on, you know, all the platforms where you listen to your podcast. Um, so before we go and before we end this live stream with all this goodness and about mental health awareness, um, everybody let our listeners, viewers know where they can reach you at. How do they get in touch with you? Uh, so that way, in case somebody might know somebody, they can refer over to you or they're, they're suffering themselves. Go ahead, Jennifer. All right. So you can reach me at uh, www.jennifertracy-inspire.com. I have pretty much everything kind of all summed up on there. But um, as I was sharing with you, Pedro, redefineyourmission.com is a new tactical toolkit that I've put together. So it's both books plus an online um, course with application guides, 40 videos. So um, Doc Springer and I have put that together. So uh, we're pretty passionate about moving that forward right now. Nice. Yeah, so, um, you can uh, you can find our information for Healthy Hire, Healthy Retire at um, www.healthyhirehealthyretired.org. Um, we are a certified 501c3 uh, charity organization, um, and you can reach us directly at info at healthyhirehealthyretired.org. Nice. All right. Um, you can hit me up on, I got a website. It's just www.chrisfields.org. And then uh, the email address is directly that is, uh, what is it? Uh, clfields1964 at gmail.com. And uh, reach out. Whoever it was that asked about the shirt, if you'll hit me up on that email, if they're still on here, I'll, I can't find it right now, but I'll find it and I'll get it to you. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I want info on it too. It's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. And anybody interested in the flags, they also um, donate part of the proceeds from their sales back to the organization that helps first responders. So nice. that's good too. Nice. Nice. And last comments that we have coming through, Danielle, you guys have been great. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle, for tuning Thanks, in Danielle. and sticking with us. <laughs> Uh, D Gordon enjoyed listening to tonight again. Thank you. Yep. Thanks D. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Red laces again, all the way from the UK. Thank you all. So nice you to all meet so you. much. Greatly Bye. appreciate it. You. And then Mr. Lewis, our winner for tonight. Uh, thank you all. Stay <laughs> safe. Lewis. Thanks, yeah. Lewis. Thank you guys all for listening. Yep. Thank you, everybody. And again, all everybody's contact information will be inside the show notes. It will definitely be um, posted everywhere uh, once I do post edit this to all of my great uh, colleagues that have uh, taken the time out to be here and to give you a little bit of them. So with that being said, we greatly appreciate it. We hope that you got some value out of this. Um, Again, thank you all, Jennifer, Chelsea, and Chris, for taking the time out and um, being able to to be here and, and give your your side and insight on mental health awareness. It definitely yep. goes a long way, and I know a lot of people will definitely be um, getting some value yep. out of this. Uh, Tony, some more comments coming. This is great. Thank <laughs> you all. Kurt, again, thank you. Really enjoyed this. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, thank you, Tony. Both, yeah. Uh, thank you for thank you for giving us this platform and, and allowing. It's nice, to, uh, Pedro and Jennifer. It's nice to put a face with the name Chelsea. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> okay. And, uh, yeah, it was so nice. Yeah, thank you so much for having us on and yeah, thanks, Pedro, connecting us all. Not a problem. So, those of you that have listened to the podcast and know, uh, I you got to ask yourself one question: What is your X factor? Until next time, we will see.